Our next speaker is Joel Tosi. Uh, Joel is a hands-on collaborator and community builder, the co-author of Creating Your Dojo and Coaching for Learning. He has been helping organizations improve the way they work for over a decade now. Uh, the talk today is really about getting a better architecture, more closely aligned to the product, which allows teams to have a lower cognitive load uh, and just makes their jobs easier. Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about those approaches that leverage the product context um, and that, sorry, aligned with the needs of the product. Everybody give it up for Joel. Great. There you go. That's the slides, the stuff, the give us social media. Give us a test click. Oh, yeah, sure. There you go. Rock and rolls. Cool. You can tell that's me because I got the same shirt on. <laughs> Easy enough. Um, so here, here's the quick context. Uh, we'll get into the architecture stuff, uh, have some fun there. Um, for kind of context, uh, started off engineer, kind of architect, manager, horrible manager, right, that kind of stuff. Um, worked at Red Hat for a few years. When I was at Red Hat, uh, I was like the, I don't know, lead architect for North America or some nonsense like that. But I remember telling, architect, or telling Red Hat, awesome technology, horrible products. <laughs> and they go, what, what do you mean by that? I go, we do the coolest stuff in the world, but like, I shouldn't have to have a CLI and pass in 15 parameters and hope it works. And then when it doesn't, guess why it didn't work? Like, it was just a weird situation. That was before OpenShift uh, was released. But then after there, it started hopping around, um, and, and like was mentioned, just trying to help organizations make it easier to do some work. Uh, when we get into this architecture stuff, I'm going to tell you a story about a, a group I'm working with, uh, but I'm going to try and tie it back. Like it's a big company, like with big company problems, but the techniques I think are relevant if you're doing kind of small startup stuff or, or big company problems. So anyway, we'll get into it here. Quick outcomes for you. Um, we're going to talk about strategic DDD as a technique, as well as C4 modeling, as well as uh, some architectural decision records, just words. There are things you can do. You don't need to hire a consultant to, uh, to do these kinds of things. By all means, you should do them yourself. Um, there are some slides at the end that I probably won't get to. It's kind of like bonus material left to the reader. All right. All right. Who knows this gentleman? It is a non-rhetorical question, and there's a big hint on the screen. It is Ward Cunningham. That's an awesome guess. What do you? Who knows about Ward Cunningham? Ooh, that's gonna stump him. What's up? It, you are. You are the second person ever to point that out to me. That's awesome. Ward Cunningham created the wiki. Kind of cool, right? Ward Cunningham also created a term that I'm sure you all use. You might use it to talk about the debt from, or the, ooh, I gave it away, the code that was written by the person before you. Technical debt. Ward Cunningham created the term technical debt. You all know what it means, right? What does technical debt mean? Writing code to the fixed layer, taking all the shortcuts, looking on Stack Overflow or ChatGPT telling me how to do this. While I, while I agree that's the perception, Ward actually has a wonderful video that he put out a few years ago where he talks about what he actually meant. What he actually meant by technical debt was you're building a product, and when you write the code, that is your understanding of the product as it is today. You're codifying the model, kind of, you're writing it out to the best you can understand it. The problem is, tomorrow you understand it better, and the next day you understand it better. And he says that gap in understanding of how you codify, codified the model of your product, that gap is technical debt. I think that's really nice because it's a little bit more humane. <laughs> it's a little more humane than saying, the dude before me wrote some really bad code and now it's technical debt. So anyway, where I'm going with that is, Keep that in mind, that the, the fact that Ward is saying uh, technical debt is the gap of our understanding of our product. Fundamentally for me, this idea of architecture is uh, any decision we make about our architecture is about an assumption in our product. If we decide that we're going to go with microservices, uh, hopefully you're doing it because you feel that that decision, it makes it better for your product that by doing microservices as a decision for your architecture, it's gonna provide you more resiliency or scalability or some kind of illity that's gonna make your product better. 
So fundamentally, the question then becomes, how do you appropriately evolve your architecture as your product evolves? How do you help, with, how do you do with, with Ward, with, blah, blah. how do you handle what Ward meant by technical debt and evolve your architecture as you learn more? So I'm gonna get boring here for a second, talk about what is architecture. This next slide uh, just shows that I'm old. Everybody knows this is architecture, right? You got a stick figure kind of off to the side. Thanks, dude. I feel, I'm glad you're nodding because this is, this is what architecture was for me in the early 2000s when I had to do architecture at the Mercantile Exchange. I just drew boxes. <laughs> I drew boxes and there was stuff in the boxes and we would say, here's the interface and here's the API and here's the business rules and I'd give it to teams and they'd have to go implement it and they would say I was wrong all the time because it turns out uh, this is pretty disconnected from reality. <laughs> This is a, a much better view of architecture with a, this picture just gets worse and worse the bigger the screen gets. <laughs> so, but let me, let me pull it back on the idea here. Uh, this is from a book, The Notes on the Synthesis of Form by Christopher Alexander. Before I have explained what this actually means, anybody heard of or know Christopher Alexander? No? All right. It's fine. Uh, let me tell you about Christopher Alexander uh, briefly, uh, and then, if nothing else, the benefit of my talk is you could look him up and find some really interesting presentations by Christopher Alexander. Christopher Alexander uh, passed away a few years ago. Christopher Alexander was a physical architect. He actually built physical buildings. What does this have to do with uh, software? Christopher Alexander actually created the idea of pattern languages, which then became software patterns. Now, as a quick tangent, Christopher Alexander, uh, in some of his books, uh, he has a, one book called The Timeless Way of Building, uh, where he talks about quality that can't be named. This dude was the coolest hippie that you will possibly ever read. When he started talking about pattern languages, he was talking about building things, uh, looking for patterns in physical buildings and places that made people feel alive. And so he wanted to capture those patterns so people built things in such a way that created like life. And that was beautiful. But then <laughs> software took over, and then nobody is ever saying, I use the singleton pattern because it makes me feel really good. I don't think that's ever happened. Totally tangential, look up Chris Alexander. When he was talking about building physical buildings, he said everything was a trade-off. He said, this is a very, uh, meant to be like almost a causal model. This actually says economy and simplicity, and when you're reading causal models, a minus means there's an inverse relationship, a plus means there's a direct relationship. So you would read this and say, if we increase the economy, if we make it cheaper to build something, it tends to become more complicated to build it. If we use cheaper materials, it becomes harder to build. If we increase the simplicity of building it, the, it might not perform as well. If we do less boards in the walls, it might not perform as well and hold up to the winds. I like that because that is my view on architecture. My view on architecture is there is no independent decisions. Everything is related to everything else, and so we have to be taking this into context. Last thing here on, this, on, the, on the Alexander's side of things, he would offer up that when he's building buildings and building uh, towns, it's th there's this type of complex relationship among, de among dependencies. It's, no, it's not just two decisions, it's many decisions. He would say that many people, and I would offer up, we do this in software, we take a bias simplification to our dependencies. We, a bias simplification could be leading with technology. The product has these types of dependencies and decision points, but we're biased by technology. We want to do microservices, or we want to have a certain type of tech stack, or these are the skills we have, and so we get a bias simplification of the, of the dependencies. And so what we're actually looking for is a way of optimally grouping things to have make, go make better decisions and kind of reason and complexity. It's a long way of saying, this is our world, don't do this, try and do this. <laughs> I think the best way to do this is with uh, some product thinking inside of architecture. So architecture then becomes about fit within context. You're gonna get architecture whether you want it or not. It's better to be intentional <laughs> than accidental. So I'll tell you the story to kind of make it real. Uh, but again, these techniques, whether you're doing a startup or you're in a mid-sized organization or a large organization, it's the same idea. Anybody uh, work or anybody leveraged domain-driven design before? Yeah? 
Cool. So a couple people, awesome. So there's two sides of domain-driven design. There's a strategic side, there's an uh, um, implementation <coughs> side. Tactical, there you go. Strategic and tactical. Strategic is kind of around the setup, tacticals are on the implementation. I'm going to walk you through uh, strategic domain-driven design and why it helps architecture, and it's very much focused in product. It's, in essence, a way of creating models that help us reason about our product and how they tie into systems. There you go. Any questions? <laughs> All right. So for context, the organization that uh, I was uh, helping, um, big company, financial space, um, as you, so a 20-year-old product, code base, Java 1, I don't know, 7, running on web logic, I don't know, 2, something horrible. As you can imagine, it started off as one team, they got some stuff done, became two teams, less was done, four teams, less gets done, 14 teams, nothing ever gets shipped, kind of like what's happening, right, those kind of problems. And so the first thing we did is, uh, all the team is one mangled code base because fundamentally they never thought about the architecture. They got accidental architecture as they grew. We took a step back and we said, from a product perspective, uh, what could the architecture look like and where should teams have logical boundaries? And then we can figure out how they should communicate kind of like a technical aspect. They had 14 teams at the end of this, they found out that if they started moving to a better product-oriented architecture, they would only ask, actually need seven teams. Now, I'm not gonna say five or seven teams, that's a horrible thing, there's a longer story to that. This is the outcome, but let's talk about how they actually got there. This is how we started. It was super hard. <laughs> we got some of the product owners, some of the architects together, and we literally just said, walk us through the events that happen in the life cycle of your product. That's all it was. There was about 30 people, 30 is a lot, it was probably too many, but 14 teams, it was like 200 people, so 30 felt like at least a nice compromise. But again, product owners and architects saying, walk us through uh, the life cycle of your product. Cool. Now, there was more than seven stickies. <laughs> There was a lot of stickies, but these are just the events. There was a prospect created, an agent gets assigned, account gets created, bank information, right? Account gets funded, they can trade, they retire, et cetera, et cetera. The first thing was just creating all these events, sequencing them out. From there, we looked for significant events. What a significant event is, is when the context changes for the product. Now, I think it was uh, Camille earlier was talking about, you know, like the, the words, you know, I think, she, ah, I forgot the word she meant. She used like a stay could mean three different things. Yeah, yeah, this is the same thing. Now for this group, the account, that was the core idea of their product was the account. The account changes at various times. Before you are, uh, you, before you actually create an account, you're a prospect, but you're in the system as an account. They're trying to market to you. They want you to, they want your money. As soon as you fill out the paperwork, now you went from a prospect to a client, and now the account means something different. Now you can do certain things inside here up until the point where they get your money. Now the account means something different. Now we're actually doing investments and we have a different responsibility up until the account gets retired, and then the account means something different. And so what we did here is we laid out all these events, and there was, again, tons of events, laid them out sequentially, and talked when the context changed of the core, uh, core entity kind of inside here. Any idea how we actually found these when the account meant something different? How do you think we could tell when the account meant something different? There was two ways. Anybody want to guess? How the stakeholder described it. How the stakeholder described it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, what I would tell you there, too, is there was a lot of stickies here. Yeah, because yeah, everybody's together, and then everybody, everybody was thinking, we got their money. <laughs> they signed the paperwork. Like, so it was obvious it meant something significant. The other one, and what do I guess what the second way was? In the database, well, for them, the mainframe. In the mainframe, they had a status table, right? And it had six different statuses. It was an O or a P or an I or an A, you know, all these kind of statuses. How that played out in the code base was, of course, 
Now, mind you, there was 14 teams, and code was everybody had to hang out together. So everybody's code had all the checks, if it's status A or B or C. So the code was horrible. So they couldn't ship anything because everybody had to know about the con of all the contexts all the time. If you're, so that's from a company trying to like figure out how to fix the problem. If you're starting up, just don't do it. <laughs> You know, start with, just kind of be a little bit intentional here and say, when do the words mean something else? We took it a little bit further. Uh, so these yellow stickies uh, were still those events. We said, what triggered these events to happen? So you have something like, if, we, if, there, if we, an agent gets assigned, it happens when we do the assign agent event. Well, the reason why we, we, we did this and walk backwards is sometimes there is a triggering event that creates multiple events to happen. So like, for example, once we create the bank information, right, we store it, but we have to verify it and we verify credit. So like there's, so we, we found events, looked for significant events, took a step backward, looked for things that happened in parallel to kind of add more fidelity and look for different uh, delineations here. These black boxes, which can't be read, third party systems, kind of creating a visualization when we add providers, those kinds of things. Again, what we're trying to do is figure out from a product perspective, where are the appropriate boundaries in the architecture? Then we got to a point where we could actually start identifying teams. This is one idea. This is one kind of idea in itself. This is actually two, uh, two ideas. It's in a larger circle because these had a necessary coupling. It turns out if you want to trade, you actually have to have money. <laughs> and then you know, when you sell it, it has to go back and forth. So there was a necessary coupling that we could visually see and call out. And so from here, we could start talking about these are the team's boundaries that we want to have. What I'll tell you about this then, uh, so again, if you're, if you're one team and you do this, it becomes just how do you want to set up you know, your modules for your deployables? Same kind of concept, it allows you to kind of to have a nice separation. And then what becomes interesting is, as the product wants to grow, you can be very intentional about where you're trying to innovate and create at. Beneficiaries is pretty, like it, you have to do this, it's a benefit of the product, but you're probably not going to be very innovative in beneficiaries. You're probably going to take on more banks, and you might have to worry about different types of APIs, but it's going to grow differently, but you know, it's not going to have a lot going on. But then when you get over here and like, you talk about trades and trade strategies, you can say, this is where we're going to be innovative at, this is where we're going to be creative at. So now, these teams don't actually have to function the same way. And so that creates a nice separation of responsibility. So again, that's kind of how we did this. You all could do that stuff. The last uh, step here is then we started talking a little bit on the, the tactical side of things around how these various teams in this example would communicate via REST APIs, published languages, you know, kind of a shared kernel type of approach, real-time messaging. These teams would be having high coupling. These teams uh, between the bank and the funding, we didn't want, we didn't want the way the funding uh, was operating to be dependent upon how the bank wanted to be. So we created an anti-corruption layer, right? So you don't get that bleed across boundaries. So again, this is just a nice way to visualize what was happening. And the last thing I would call out for you is these orange stickies at the top here. The orange stickies are the minimalist amount of data that that area has to, has to own because it is core to this area. The beneficiaries have to know about the relationship with the beneficiaries, right? Not everybody else has to know about it. So we're creating data isolation. So again, this was an organization that had a mainframe where all the data was in one database. And we're talking about now separating it out so teams and areas owned data that was contextually aware for their area. This, so again, if you're starting up, this is just a nice way of separating data because if you don't, <laughs> it's gonna get bad later on. In this organization, as soon as we started talking about separating out data, people hated me. People hated me. Because the first question is, but we need one source of truth. How would you ever have one source of truth if four different teams have four different data stores? Has anybody ever had to answer the question, tell me all of my customers ever and everything about them and everything they have ever done? Nope. The questions you answer are usually relative to the context of a product and a domain of your product. 
When did these beneficiaries added and who do they relate to? How, how frequently are we trading? Are we having any errors in trading? How are people's margins? The, the questions that people are asking about data are relative to their domains. And so having one data store is actually just kind of silly. And so if you do this well, the questions and getting the data actually becomes easier. All right. Eric Evans talks about a whirlpool model. So like, well, I'll tell you this, the, the way we set that up, we came up with a scenario, we modeled it out, we did a little bit of code probing, worked with a little bit of teams, see what ideas we missed, added more fidelity. What I would tell you this is then as the, re even uh, we would do a second scenario and talked in that example about what happens when we want to go to Canada. Do the models change? Do the domains change? Nope, then I think we're in a pretty good spot. When we find out new requirements, it could be a new scenario, it might change the model, it might not. But it just becomes like this, this easy way of vetting out, are we doing the right thing? If you want to start, event storming is a technique, right? Uh, using the, the significant events, look for when context changes, identify boundaries, teams or modules, right? Respond to uh, events or publishing events. The things that I tell you to look out for, uh, if you're in a large organization, if somebody wants to do like inventory work, like we have to know where all the systems and reports fit, that's kind of nonsense. Uh, what I found by doing the, that kind of mapping and the boundaries is there is duplication of work everywhere. And so as soon as you start talking about kind of context and where should it be, the duplication goes away and this inventory stuff just becomes you know, kind of noise. So we, we just did not inventory stuff. And then ubiquitous language as a signal. Um, similar to the idea of like that idea of a, a, a stay that Camille mentioned this morning, in, in DDD there's this idea of ubiquitous language. Inside any bubble inside there, inside of any team, a word should mean one thing and one thing only. The first team I worked with when we were trying to uh, re-architect this platform had a bug. Hard to believe, none of you have bugs, but this group did. The bug that came in said, uh, when there is over 200 people in the network, it crashes. What do you think that means? Because I asked the team, I go, what, is, what, is, what does this network mean? <laughs> what do you think network means? Is there a limit on their API? Is there a limit in API? Yeah, it could be. It feels something like that, right? And so there was something where the mainframe could only do 200, this is silly, the mainframe could only handle 200 writes per second and then it blew up, which is hilarious because that's billions of dollars. That's one thing it meant. It had two other meanings. It also meant, so, so it had a very uh, a t technical implementation. It also meant the network was, uh, if you're a prospect in that left domain, uh, if you're a prospect, it's all the people you know because we want to market to them all. And so that's what it meant. And it also meant if you were in the middle uh, over here and you were doing this trading stuff, if you were an employer, all of your employees were your network. So we had one team where one word meant three things. That's a problem, <laughs> right? And so you look for those words that have extra meaning and fix those with your teams because those should be split out. Like one team shouldn't have three words mean, or one word mean three things. So look for those things and you get to a better spot. So you can use strategic DDD uh, to reduce cognitive load, uh, move towards reduced coupling. As the team started moving this way, their work became significantly easier because they, the, the if statements were gone. They knew when stuff came in, it was this context. They didn't have to guess, right? Now, I'm not going to tell you we put up virtual stickies and drew circles and therefore we solved the world hunger. We actually had to still do work, right? There was still work. So it took, uh, this was probably about 16 months in, and I think four of the seven teams are now kind of independent. They're in their new architecture. They have the, you know, kind of be able to run on their own. Three are still working towards it. It's not an overnight thing, but modernized, kind of moving in a good spot. So I think as your product evolves, so does your model. Keep on updating those uh, domains. And that was very strategic. At some point in time, we got to get tackled and say, how are teams um, going to actually do their work? From there, we actually get into C4 modeling. Anybody seen, done C4 modeling? Yeah, good experiences? We're still doing it. Still doing it, as I said, that seems pretty non-committal, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. For, if you haven't done C4 modeling, it's a, think about it this way, it's like pinch zoom on architecture. 
You can zoom out to the highest level. You see product uh, personas. You can zoom in a little bit and you can see systems. You can zoom a little bit more and see services. You can zoom a little bit further and see code. The idea is it ties it all together and whatever question you want to answer, you can zoom in or out to the right level and get an answer. We used it because we had all these teams and we wanted to see how does everybody fit. So we had those bubbles and we wanted to see that, that we start, wanted to start talking about the architecture that was relevant inside the bubbles. Here, this will not be their stuff because it'd be bad if I showed you their architecture inside. So this is the generic example from C4. The first level being context, you have persona, uh, interacting with our system, supporting systems. What I want to call out here is the language is very much in the product. A customer of the bank with accounts views account balances using, so kind of active verb language, using our systems. We can see what a, our system provides, right, and what we get benefits from other parts. For, for the seven teams, we had one C1, right? One kind of context, a little bigger than this. If I were to click on this, right, we get into the, the, the C2 level, the containers level. Container doesn't mean Docker, uh, just means kind of uh, parts of the product. So now inside this dotted line would be the blue box from before. You still have persona, supporting systems, but now you can see the uh, parts inside of the, the banking system that make up the whole thing together and you can see what they provide. With the seven teams at this level, each of these was actually a team. So it was one bubble. You could see what they provided. You could see what other teams they interacted with. You could see how they served the customer. You could see a little bit of other tech stack. If they were uh, Angular, if they were Spring, if they, if they were uh, .NET shop, everybody inside here could be their own tech stack because they weren't coupled together. So you can see each team and what they were doing, what they're providing, and that provided a nice context. So at the C1 and the C2 level, there was one view across seven teams. Once we got into C3, then each individual team starts talking about the services they provide to serve all their teams and to serve the product. So the C3, uh, the third C is the components. For me, it was about services and the things we provided. So inside here, you might see all of their services, all of their messaging, uh, any of their uh, external facing uh, applications or how they were interacting to solve problems for the persona. This was nice because it gave us a little bit more detail around uh, the, of course, the, 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 the service we were, uh, services we were creating, uh, the technologies behind them. With the first team we did, they could start talking about bringing their data store in, the type of data store they chose, why they chose the data store they did, did they do a, a non-relational database? Did they do a relational database? Did they have a, a cache level? Was the cache necessary because of uh, frequency of reads? What's the speed necessary? What's the quality necessary? So again, I love this because it's context rich. It's from the product outside coming in. We see how we interact with teams. Now we see the services we provide and the choices we make that go about serving our product. The last thing I'd call out for you here is uh, if anybody has to work with security, no, all right, don't worry about it then. Now, if you have to work with security, prior to doing this, security was very much a blanket statement. They didn't really have context of, the, of what any teams were doing, so they just kind of said, you all can't do anything. As soon as security was able to see the context of uh, the data the team had, the services they were providing, who was consuming it, then security could actually make intentional recommendations. Make sure you secure the customer's uh, PII information this way. Make sure you mask it this way. I really don't care about these services because there's nothing interesting about them. Do what you want. I mean, don't do what you want. But like, they're, not, they're not as interesting. So the security group could be very intentional with where they wanted to help. So again, a richer conversation because we had all this context inside here. And again, at the team level, they were able to say things like, again, we're going to have this type of data store, this type of messaging because it solves this problem for this context. Really nice and rich. And then there's the C4 level, the code level. Uh, this is just mostly for completion for you, so you know what the fourth C is. I didn't do this. <laughs> I didn't do this not because it's bad. I didn't, I, did, I didn't do this because uh, tools re will reverse engineer this for you uh, and create this for you, so we didn't need to create it. But also, like, if we do one, two, and three well, then this fourth level should be so simple. And it was. It was so simple that, like, my, like drawing it out, like I used to have to do when I was at the Mercantile Exchange with stick figures, 
it just wasn't interesting. And so we didn't need to do it. So we did the first three and everybody was happy. And then er as teams started flushing this C3 out, the third level out, they were being very social. And this is what they were sharing across teams. Again, if you're one team, this is just so nice way to talk about the responsibilities that you're providing. Kind of like, what are the services? What are the responsibilities? Let's not duplicate effort. I had a nice realization with this group around testing. Um, but you all test, so this is probably, no? You test, right? Yeah, good, all right. At this organization, they had one of those blanket statements, everybody has to have, oh geez, everybody has to have 80% code coverage because 80% code coverage, right? That kind of nonsense. Um, when there was 14 teams, testing was impossible, right? Uh, uh, testing was impossible because Nobody, if you wanted to test making a trade, you had to start by creating an account, right? And so then, of course, people that aren't engineers are complaining to the engineers, why don't you write more test automation? It's like, because it's impossible. It, it fails half the time, right? Because they had no way of creating state. As soon as we laid out this, the, the, the strategic DDD, separating teams, and we talked about C4s, the conversation became super easy. Unit tests. Integration tests, functional tests, regression, right? Make sure you don't break yourself. Make sure you're not breaking your team. Don't break other teams. Don't break the customer. And then it became super easy. Still had to write tests, but at least it became easier. And then it became, once we had these boundaries, then they could actually create state, do proper integration tests, right? They were able to do good things. So again, I like this. It made testing easier, and we went a good way. If you want to do this, Start with the product context, get that persona, think actions, add fidelity, socialize it as you go. All right, I'll tell you this, uh, just like Ward would tell you, you're gonna learn as you go, so obviously update uh, your models as you go, as your C4 models as you go. Look out for loops and proxies. I, did, I have seen it where when we do a C4, you have like team A tells team B, team B tells team C, team C tells team A pretty much a bad idea, like why, why are we doing kind of circular stuff? So like look out for the kind of loops when you see them, simplify the, the model, uh, and look out for like hub and spoke stuff. Everybody goes through one <laughs> team to go to another team, like you have the, the hub and spoke, the, a proxy to all the APIs. Be very careful because then you're just introducing single points of failure, so like kind of look out for those types of situations. Last few ideas here for you, and then the last ones will be left, you know, exercises for the readers. Um, very frequently, I'll be working with teams that make architectural decisions and they don't know why. <laughs> so if you're not doing architectural decision records, ADRs, anybody doing ADRs? Yeah, awesome. See, you're a, you all could do this without me. <laughs> all right. a a ADR has been around for uh, probably about a decade. It's very simply just a way of recording when you make an architecturally significant decision, recording it uh, with context. The, the format, you give it a, a, a title, you talk about the decision you made, talk about the trade-offs, give it a date and revisit it. Uh, I had a team that I was working with that was doing um, kind of important work. <laughs> it was first responders. So there's a fire, there's a medical emergency, people need to get there, cool, move on. They actually had a very significant architectural decision come up. Um, the decision was around when you put a, a location into a map, to find out routes. If the location uh, was, not with, was not exact, you could have an error, right? And so we talked about how we could solve that problem. We could, you know, uh, uh, set up tolerances and all this other kind of fun stuff where if it's, if it's within 10 feet, you know, you ignore it. If it's not, you know, you give some kind of alert message, et cetera. And we could do a whole bunch of complicated stuff. The root of the problem if there's a fire, got to put it out. Turns out the solution can't be, you know what, I know the fire is on fire, but it's 15 feet away and you said 10, so I'm going to ignore it. That would be a bad idea. So we had an architectural decision. We said we are not going to solve this problem. Here are the trade-offs. Here's why we did it. Here's the context. We move on. Because what, I guarantee you that decision is going to come up in a few months and somebody's going to say, why didn't you fix this problem? It's not on the map because it turns out you gotta put out a fire, right? There's context there. 
they had another decision around uh, the maps and, and the data for like cities. If they, if they brought it in-house and put it in a Kubernetes cluster, it had a cost and time ramification of it. Or if they used public, it would be different. They had to make a decision, so they had to capture the decision they made, why they made it, and the trade-offs of it. Right? So these are very important things that you can't just ignore because the future you is going to say, why did we not fix this before? Capture these, put them in your repos, uh, and let people know about them. I like to think about it this way. When you're making these assumptions in your architecture, document it, think about ways you could be wrong, and think about what you might do differently. All right. Here's, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll give you like a quick one minute overview of this, and then if you're interested, you can get into it more. I get kind of weird, and I think teams that are building stuff, um, I think the context of the work and the context of the way the team works should probably define how they work. So like if you're new kind of startup space versus you're in an established market versus you're uh, trying to you know, extract value, the way you go about uh, testing and building and deploying should be contextually aware. Um, I see a problem where everybody wants to do the same thing over and over again. In some organizations that I work with, they get into this vicious cycle where they have a lot of ideas and they don't think about their architecture, so everything gets coupled together. And since everything's coupled together, they can't ship things as fast, so they want to plan more stuff at the same time. And since they're planning more stuff, they have to figure out where they're going to go, not just in a month, or where are they going to go in three months. I had a group this morning email me about their plans for the next two years. It's dumb. <laughs> and then as soon as you plan for more and you have high coupling, teams get overloaded. When teams get overloaded, you get more defects. When you get more defects, it takes longer to ship stuff. When it takes longer to ship stuff, people want more stuff. This cycle doesn't end unless you actually fix your architecture. We'll get back to that. Inside the DD space, there's this idea of context mapping. This is an overloaded uh, picture here with some, some various terms, but here's how it shakes out. You can see it inside here. We had this team and this team, and then these kind of teams kind of coupled together, necessary coupling. What I like to think about is from a product context, uh, as well as where the work is happening and where there is necessary coupling, that should, de that should determine how teams work together. These teams should work together a lot. It doesn't mean they have to plan together. It means they need to work together. Don't just talk, build. These teams probably don't. So don't make th this team work at the same cadence as this team. Don't, make, don't say all seven of you have to get together to plan everything. It just doesn't make sense. And so I, you know, think about the product, figure out your teams, figure out your architecture for your teams, and then look at communication patterns and do communication patterns that make sense for your product and where, where the creation and innovation needs to happen, where the collaboration actually needs to happen. You can check that out later. Um, I'll tell you this, so it, kind of in summer here, back to my early days, creating stick figures in boxes was never anyone's job, although it was mine for a few years <laughs> and I was horrible at it. I think this, in, in any kind of uh, architectural space, you want to provide modeling. Make it easier for people to do work, give them rich context, make it easy for them to make decisions, write less code, make more people happy. There's this a whole, you're all super smart, there's nothing you couldn't build. It doesn't mean you should build it all. <laughs> Use proper context and proper understanding. I like this term, maneuverable systems. Easy to, to, to shift and to move around. And they have uh, great systems that bring joy for people. I think the coolest thing any of us could do uh, as engineers is if a year from now somebody came up to you and was like, man, that system you laid out, dude, it is so easy to work in. I love it. That would be cool. If that happens for any of you, I applaud you. If it's already happened, you're even better than me. Because usually I just get, why, why, how did we get here? It's like, oh man, let me tell you how the stories. There you go, so there's a recap. Use the product uh, context to guide your architecture and your teams. Talk about DDD, C4, some ADR stuff. Remember uh, Ward, I would tell you this, instead of like being mad about a, pre a technical debt, appreciate it. It was our understanding of our product then. Now we know more as you learn, refactor, and go. Some awesome books you can check out. Uh, Jerry Weinberg, if you don't know him, a uh, systems thinking book, but that All Your Lights On helps you think about problems. Christopher Alexander, 
wonderful books around uh, architecture and kind of thinking about relationships, and then those bottom books in the DDD space. That's what I got. What questions do you have? All right, I'll find you. Hello. Uh, in, uh, in his book, Fred Brooks, talk, The Mythical Man Month, <laughs> he talks about how you can really only effectively split work between teams that don't talk to each other. Yeah. But that's kind of, I mean, that, that book is, turns 50 next year. A yeah. um, lot of great stuff that's very true in it. But I think you showed how like, even the teams who don't work together still have to like, work together. They have to like, share the assumptions together. One of the hardest things I find doing that is effectively documenting that stuff yeah. to share with teams. Do you have any advice on the, a good way, maybe not the best way, maybe that doesn't exist, but a good way to share learnings, assumptions between highly disconnected teams? Are you talking like highly disconnected in the world of like asynchronous? And like well, just like when you showed like there's like five teams and like yeah. these two teams need to work very closely together, but yeah. like how like, do all five of those teams still share some sense of learnings and what's a good way that isn't just like creating more work for yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question, dude. Um, quick tangent and then I'll promise to answer the question. Like I, I, I dig the space and I dig the, the Wi-Fi password of like learn by doing. And the reason why I dig it is uh, that's kind of like what I try and have teams do is instead of like, you know, plan and talk and document, like do stuff and share experiences. Where I'm going with that is uh, even like with those, it ended up being seven teams, they had to have some kind of like macro level kind of goals they're coming for and those kinds of things, right? They have to kind of roll the same direction. Doesn't mean they have to kind of do macro level kind of planning. But like what I, what I have those teams do is they still have their, their demo cadences. The demos though are never about here's what I did the last two weeks, here's what I didn't do, here are my blockers. It's, it, it's never that kind of boring. It's always the kind of like, I'm gonna tell you a story about what we're trying to get to. Here's the things I learned trying to get there. Here's the new questions I have. And once you get teams to be able to share that information, then, then, then the, the communication uh, across teams becomes way easier. So I like it from that vehicle. I, if you're inside of a team, we do the same thing. Um, if you're all doing like the stand-up things, nothing against stand-ups, but I don't like the three questions. I don't like going around the room and then nobody listens to each other and everybody just says, here's what I did today, here's what I did, you know, blockers, blah, blah, blah. I like the same question of like, together we're trying to go somewhere. Did we learn anything interesting that we want to share? Did we invalidate any assumptions? Do we need to change direction based upon something we learned? Those are better conversations. That, so this is where I think like if, the, if we make our time together more meaningful, more intentional, then I think that's better. All I have to say, I, I document less and less uh, if I can have more and more rich conversations. Now, I like ADRs for capturing assumptions. I like some of the, I like socializing C4s so we can talk about where we're at, but those are just kind of recording mechanisms. They're not anything more than that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I got short arms, bro. Hi there. Um, so my question for you is that this seems like the same process and the same framework but over multiple companies so my my question for you is did you work in these companies and solve these problems or are you like an external group that goes to companies to solve their problems both bet <laughs> so so uh with that example with that financial organization uh stop me if you heard this before they brought in the external consultant, you know, me, and they said, our teams aren't going fast enough, make them go faster, right? And so of course, that's just a, that's a horrible idea because probably it's not, I'm not gonna fix anything, there's something else going on. And so then that, that's when we started looking at this and saying, hey, like, let's talk about how this could actually work. And it was like, so I'm not the kind of person that's ever gonna say, I put stickies on a board, <laughs> good luck. Then I get in and I go with the teams and I say, now we gotta do this because it gets harder kind of the more you get into it. So yeah, so it, it's, it, please, yeah, it was kind of set up and to kind of guide people on, a, on an approach and then do it and then make sure it makes sense and kind of rinse, wash, repeat. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can tell you like um, that data stuff, when we first talked about it, like I got people were really mad at me. I was on a call with them last week 
where the, the product owners were actually talking about the data and like where is it appropriate. So like it took a while to get there, but like we had to like show, a, show an approach, show it work, kind of get through the questions, get to the bumpiness, and then it's, it's good. There you go. Hi. Oh, there you go, dude. Yeah. Um, in the context of maybe a startup where a problem has been defined but code hasn't been written yet, yeah. what do you recommend is the right amount and the right approach to plan, an archi like plan the architecture um, without over-architecting because obviously requirements change pretty frequently at the start of something? I think, so it's a good question. So if you're in a startup space, it kind of, I would say this kind of depends around um, there's this, uh, this topic around called, uh, not topic, uh, frame called uh, change horizons. I if we make a decision uh, and we have to make a, a change, how long would it take to roll out that change? So like in that example with that um, uh, first responders, some of their change horizons, if they were to like change the way the data for the maps was stored, it has a, a, a long ramification because it has a ripple effect across those kinds of things. And so in that type of aspect, I would say we would want to do more intentional architecture with a lot of experimentation. Uh, but for other parts of their architecture, I wouldn't do a lot because it, the change horizon is very near. So I think what you need to figure out inside of any of your startups is the essence of your product uh, and then what is the change horizon on those, those, those the, the core aspects of your, the core aspects of your project, product, and then do the appropriate amount of uh, experimentation and, uh, around, and documentation on the architecture there. That group, just for kind of context, they also wrote their own rules engine. Now, that was a bad idea, right? Because like, let's be honest, no one's going to uh, a first responder SaaS product because they have a really good rules engine. A rules engine's a solved problem. So like we also have to, like the conversation we had with the architects there too was don't solve solved problems. Super smart engineers, they built a beautiful rules engine that they spend 50% of their time updating. Not a good spend of your money. So again, look for your differentiators, find the essence of your product, do appropriate uh, experimentation in that architecture, and then document that appropriately. Yeah, yeah. I know you were waiting, you had a question, dude. But you don't have a mic. <laughs> I didn't mean to single anybody else out, I just didn't want to forget about them. Yeah. Uh, my question was, so if you're, um, is it enough to just do your architecture planning with like the C4 model in your head, or do you have teams like actually break out Structurizer and commit that to a repo somewhere? We 100% break it out, write it down, and commit it to a repo. Whether it's dry O or something else, yeah, we 100% commit it. Uh, I had th that, that um, first responder group, that was the first time they had done C4, and I kid you not, there were so many questions about it because like the, the one main guy was like, I had this in my head for years. And he goes, but he, he didn't even understand what he had in his head. And so as he was kind of externalizing it, then he was able to flush out his own ideas. The team could ask questions. 100% externalize it. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're a, per, if you're a person of one, <laughs> I would externalize it. Yeah, yeah. What else you got? This is on. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I looked online, I didn't see any other questions. I think that might be it. Any final questions? Everybody give it up for Joel. Thank you so much. Thank you.